Hey folks, just a little bit of housekeeping before we launch into the episode. Please uh, remember that all of the information provided in these podcasts is for information purposes only. We are never offering treatments, cures, whatever, for any kind of disease or medical condition. Anything you hear about here is going to be intriguing. There's some research around it, but make sure that you check with your medical provider before you go off and um, do any of this stuff for yourself, all right? So, um, Enjoy the episode. And also, if you're looking to connect with me for any reason, um, with your comments, questions, whatever it may be, you can reach me through my website, which is natnidham.com, or you can find me on Facebook in the Biohack in the Optimizing Superhuman Performance group or on me we in the biohacking superhuman performance group and of course you can also follow me on instagram which is at natalie nidham natalie is with an h between the t and the a the second a so thank you so much for being here appreciate you guys enjoy the episode hey folks welcome back to the podcast today is a very special episode um it's special for a bunch of reasons one of them is that this is the 100th podcast of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast, which is slightly mind-blowing to me, actually. <laughs> um, and then the other reason why it's special is because of the person that you see on screen with me. And this is a woman who you normally never see, but it is thanks to this lady right there um, that the podcast has, I think, grown the way that it has in the last, um, I guess you've been with me, like it's actually probably a year anniversary now, Erin. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, actually, probably. Actually, this is this is like a double <laughs> celebration because Erin Ryan, who you see over there, who I don't talk about Erin that much because I like to keep her my best kept secret. She produces a few good, great podcasts out there. And I was so fortunate that she was willing to take on this little podcast last year. And um, so Erin Ryan is the producer of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. Uh, she works her magic. She holds me together. She um, shares a lot of the wisdom in um, the social media posts that people have been reading and commenting on lately saying, oh my God, you have this amazing way of distilling the information in the podcast. I'm like, yeah, actually, that's not me. That's her. That's Erin. So thank you, Erin. And Erin's going to help me today. She's going to sit on my side of the mic and I'm going to be on the other side. So thank you so much and welcome. And thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm excited to do this episode. I feel like so many people get to hear your amazing guests and they don't get to hear enough about Nat. So today we get to hear all about Nat. So I'm so excited to interview you. <laughs> and yeah, it's weird being on the, the camera side of the mic. But that's okay. I'm excited. So should we just jump right in? I have so many questions I want to ask. Yeah, I think we should probably just jump right in because okay. why, why keep people waiting? I know. And having <laughs> heard on my end, having heard almost all hundred episodes. Now I'm like, how are we going to distill it all down? But I think I have some ideas of, of things we can highlight and we can always do a part two. Yeah. Okay. So for starters, you obviously have a deep fascination with many different forms of biohacking. I'm wondering if you can tell us like what's, what started your interest in biohacking and then how did you, how did that lead to starting a podcast? Like what made you jump in and join this podcast world? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's a good question actually. So I think my fascination with biohacking really, and, it, and probably it was, it's been with me all along. It just wasn't articulated as biohacking and because, and maybe this all goes back to my definition of biohacking, which is, and I think it's the same as many people's, but, you know, for a long time, the word biohacking was a very scary word to a lot of people. It sounded like, I don't know, are you implanting microchips into your body? Like, you know, that $6 million man thing, if anybody here is young enough, old enough to actually know what that is, where, which was this weird TV show. science. Yeah, yeah, weird science with like, you know, bionic arms and things, which, you know, ironically is kind of like sort of a thing, not like it was in the show. Anyway, but it was, it's, I think it, what it is, is I've always been interested in and fascinated by, with, by the human body. I've always believed that the human body has this incredible capacity to heal itself if we can get everything out of the way. So that's that's kind of step with that. That's probably explains more my my fascination with health and and that and you know all that we can do to improve our health. 
But the biohacking thing really came in, I guess, as I got older and started to realize, oh, wait a minute, just, just doing the regular stuff is actually probably not going to be enough to get me to my finish line in the way that I want to get to my finish line. And I often talk to people about this in that, you know, if, if we look at mother nature's path for us, as it were, we, we have this very predictable course. We start our, as children, young adults, we hit our prime. We're in our reproductive years. Hopefully we make babies if that's our, you know, if that's our chosen path, let's say, but from, from mother nature's perspective, we're supposed to make babies. And once we've made our babies and raised our babies, Then as far as mother nature is concerned, she's like, okay, well, you know, we're going to hang on to you for a little while to support this next generation. And then we're going to let you gently ride off into the sunset. And, you know, that riding off into the sunset generally is accompanied with a decline in performance in every way that we can imagine. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a society, we've decided, yeah, you know, that's just not going to cut it for me. I want to live longer. I want to live better. I want to be kicking ass in my 70s and my 80s and potentially into my 90s. And so biohacking to me is all of the things that we can do that will help us to maintain that, that performance and that vitality right to the end of our journey. So that's my, that's kind of my fascination with it. And then how it led to a podcast, maybe the podcast really, I, I I mean, I don't know how many other people who have podcasts can say this, but I resisted a podcast for the longest time. I, I was like, there's no way the world needs another podcast. And I would say this forever and ever until I found peptides. And when I found peptides, I, the first thing I did was I co-founded a a Facebook community, which is now the Optimizing Superhuman Performance uh, Facebook community, which this week, actually, we just passed 11,000 members. Um, But the reason why I founded that community was to feed my obsession with peptides once I'd learned about them. And, And then I started the podcast really quite simply as a way to get people who knew more about peptides than me, which was pretty much everyone, um, to talk to me about peptides so that I could provide information to the group. And I mean, it's as simple as that. Like that was my, my kind of my driver for creating the podcast. And so both for me to get the information and to share it out to the world, because I was so blown away by peptides and, and how they'd been so hidden that, I just thought, you know, this is going to be the way to get it out there. That's awesome. I love hearing how people get to, you know, the thing that they do and what drove them there. I mean, that's how I became a podcast producer is I was either going to go to school for functional medicine or keep my marketing degree and be like, what can I do with my marketing degree? So I chose the like least expensive option. Um, but I was so passionate about just, you know, some health goings on for myself and, um, different doctors, um, many doctors who did not help. So that sparked a lot of curiosity for me. And then doctors who helped right away. And there was this huge chasm between the two. And I'm like, what is going on in health? Like, I really didn't know. I didn't even know the word functional medicine. I just, I stumbled on it in a, you know, desperation of trying to figure out what was going on with my gut health and my energy and brain fog and forgetting people's names and just like full body breakdown. And I didn't know what was going on. And it just, it, it it really lit a fire in me when I found people who were like, Oh, it's this thing. When I had just dealt with so many people who said, I don't know, I don't know. I'm sending you home with another IBS, you know, Mm -hmm. diagnosis. I was just like, I, I, that this can't be all there is, you know what I mean? Just like you're saying with health, like this or with declining, um, I don't know, I guess like vitality, you know, yeah. it's just, there's like this, there can't be, all, this can't be all there is not when the human body is so amazing. So that's, that's, I think how many of us come to what we do, hopefully, you know, and people have a fire and drive and passion behind what they do, because it comes from somewhere where you're like, I got to share this stuff or yeah. I got to work for that organization, or I got to build uh, a business where I can, you know, help people get their voice out there. So it's, it's, a, um, I think it's just so much more people can hear the passion in your voice. And it's so much more clear that you come to it from a place of passion and not 
just like, oh, I think I'll start a podcast today. Um, so, <laughs> I can't think of anything else to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's great. So I, I'm kind of wondering, and I actually don't know this for myself. So in your previous life or whatever you want to call that sort of your first part of your career development with that, was that in the lane of peptides or, or health, or was that something totally different? You mean before I became yeah, a nutritionist? Before you, mm-hmm. mm, yeah, no. So I started off in studying human physiology in college, uh, okay. but my first career was actually advertising sales. Oh, and, that, no. I and magazine that. publishing. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, but what I did, the way that I kind of kept that, because there was a part of me that always wanted to have something to do with health and, and wellness. And so the way I fed that beast, and maybe a little bit the performance beast, which maybe came into play a little bit on the podcast side later in life, was that I was always a fitness instructor. So I always had this kind of, You know, I kind of had this hand in health and wellness by being a fitness instructor pretty much my whole life. Like I didn't retire from teaching until, oh God, I'm actually, you know what? I retired from teaching when I went back to school to become a nutritionist. That's, that's when I retired. Um, But that was the thing that kind of kept me engaged and kept me in this world of health pretty much my entire life. It was just in a much more side hustle kind of way until it, yeah. became, until it became my main hustle. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I guess it turns out we have, that's why we get along so well. Now we have a similar stories. I've been teaching dance and fitness and all kinds of stuff. And, um, I, I wanted to go in the lane of health, but my brother, my brother and sister and mom are all nurses. My dad went to school for, um, I think he was going to become an EMS, um, it, person. I don't know what you wow. at yeah, one yeah, point. Yeah. So he was in school for, um, for that. And so like everyone's medical in my family and I'm like the black sheep of the, of the family in terms of like, I still had that interest, but I could not go near bodies. <laughs> like I could oh, not deal kidding. with blood. No, like I, I tried to be like a tech at one point and I, I, um, was a phlebotomist and like, I would be the one to pass out when oh, I had to put no. the needle in their arms. <laughs> I was like, that's what made me the black sheep of the nursing family is I was like, I can't, I cannot, but I was still so fascinated. And so like, funny enough, like I spent three years working at a pharmaceutical, you know, facility where they tested drugs on phase one and phase two, you know, people, cause I was really fascinated by that. And now I'm like a little bit on the other side of it, like oh my God. Drugs have their place, but absolutely a whole lot more we can do. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm glad you decided to do what you do, but you know, functional medicine is all will always be there for you. You're young. Yeah. You never know. It's true. It's true. You never know. So <clears throat> In terms of biohacking, my, my curiosity is also that, um, so many, I guess there was just so many, it was a male driven conversation for so long, it seemed like, and cause I've sort of had my, you know, I've heard the conversation of biohacking going on for a long time, especially in the fitness world, but yeah, it just that seemed like more of a male conversation going mm-hmm. on. And now just in the past you could probably say 10 years, but I would say really in the past five years, there's just a yeah. ton, a growing number of women creating platforms, discussing, um, biohacking from the female perspective, which is so helpful for all of us. Right. Because as we know, we're not, we're not males and there's, our bodies are just so incredibly different. So I was wondering, why do you feel it's important for women to lead discussions on biohacking? And is there a women's approach to biohacking? Yeah. Well, I think yes, on all counts. And, and it's important. I mean, look, it's important for women to be a part of the biohacking sphere in many ways. And frankly, because it's an extension of the scientific sphere and for so many, well, until even now, the reality is that most medical research is still done on men, really only in the last, I think it's only in the last 20 years, maybe, that there have been rules implemented that say that scientific research now also has to be conducted on women. And look, we can see it from both sides. On the one hand, the last thing a researcher wants are variables that they can't control. The reality of the human, of the of women is that we are full of variables that can't be controlled. We have hormonal, 
we have hormonal um, waves that that we ride every month and that a lot of people will say we are four different women through the month because of our, our hormone shifts. So yes, and maybe our personalities. And then there's all your personalities. Exactly. So, but, but the fact of the matter is that as you alluded to, women are not small men. We respond differently to different treatments. We respond differently to medications. We need different dosing and not just sometimes smaller. It needs to be different. So the fact of the matter is that having women in this space is critical, both to represent women, to drive that conversation and to look at things from a woman's perspective. So we can look at it obviously from, from a medical drug perspective, but even when it comes to biohacking, when it comes to whether it's cold, deliberate cold exposure or things like fasting or all of these different lifestyle interventions are going to land differently for women than they will for men. And even the way that we eat, right? Like a woman may need to cycle her macros during the month to be able to support proper hormonal balance. So look, girls know girls best. And it's not that a man can't figure it out, but I just think it's inherently important for a woman's approach. And we also, I think we think about things differently. We approach things a little bit differently. Maybe, maybe sometimes we're, we just have a different sensibility and approach than men. And I think that that's an important balance to have. Male, mm-hmm. nothing wrong. I love our men and the men biohackers and the men doctors and all the health professionals and all the guys. But at the same time, having that yin yang, having that balance between the male perspective and the female perspective, I think has only made our our space richer and more balanced in many ways. How many words? Oh, How many times can I use the word balanced? Do you think in one sentence? No, <laughs> I, I think. I mean, you're right, and also I think. And I, I know that this may or may not be a consideration, but because women think differently, like we're liable to come up with a lot of different kinds of biohacking that men haven't thought of, right? Like yeah. we have a different type of brain. I know that now from becoming a mother recently, like we just have a different brain. I'm able to remember the list of 12 things. And I know that my husband is an extremely smart man. Um, but he, it's easier for him to remember a list of three at a time, you know, like not that he can't remember 12 things, but you know, I, even as a mom, I'm like, wow, that, that is a thing. It really is. Like we just think differently. We have to, right. Um, yeah. And, and it's, and it's interesting because, you know, rather than berate him for not thinking the same way as you do, it's a little bit of, okay, well, how can we tap into your superpower and my superpower? Like how do they mesh? And, and I think that, the, the dialogue has to remain open, friendly, and not more than friendly. It's just, we also tend to be more collaborative. Too, yeah. Right. That's true. Um, yeah. Just the way that we're wired, we tend to be more collaborative. We're more likely very often to bring in people who complement us and who cannot, who can do the things that we can't do as well. So it, all of that adds up to just a different perspective and a different approach that, yeah. I, again, I just think it's made biohacking a better world. And, yeah, you know, we've, we've got, you know, by the time this airs, it'll be right around the same time or maybe, no, actually, I think this is scheduled to come out June 14th. We'll be in the middle of this women's online biohacking conference, like the first mm. of its kind. That's just that's just being launched by uh, Orshi mm-hmm. McNaughton, who's the biohacker chick. And she approached me over a year ago and said, Nat, I want to start this women's biohacking conference. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. But at the time I was up to my eyeballs and alligators, like I had too many things going on. I'm like, good luck to you. I can't be a part of it. (laughs) But, you know, lucky for me, she came back and asked me to be a speaker for her, uh, Mm -hmm. which I'm so grateful for. But more and more, we're just seeing this like women stepping into these roles and taking leadership roles in the space, which I think is just again, it's just going to make this all better for everybody. Yeah, I think so too. And to that end, where does age play a role in that? Cause you talked about like your, your interests becoming more and more, or you became more and more interested in biohacking as you were aging and noticing different things. Um, so how do you, you know, have that age conversation with some of your guests and why is that important to you to share that to, to women 
your age or everyone your age. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, you know, this is a space that tends to be pretty youthful. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I definitely feel sometimes like I'm the grandma in the space kind of thing. Not at all. (laughs) <laughs> but I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm a lot older than a lot of the people in this space. And I think that, again, it brings a different perspective. I have mm-hmm. I have a longer rear view view of the world. I can see the challenges of aging maybe more directly than people. So I relate to it a little bit differently. I see things through a slightly different lens and um I'm not able to, like, I just think it brings a different perspective, right? The, the, the biohacking through the ages, and it's not like a younger biohacker can't look ahead and talk about longevity, but they're looking at it still from a very different perspective. There's something about living it and living through it and going through certain experiences that gives you a perspective that, frankly, I wouldn't have expected to have had before I went through it myself. I mean, you probably see it just as being a mom. Like, before you're yeah. a mom, you're like oh my God, like, why don't you just tell that kid to shut up? Or why can't you make your child do this? Or yeah. God, if that was my kid, there's no way he'd be eating coffee grounds out of the bag. However, <laughs> which my child does, by the way, that's an inside joke. <laughs> fortunately, Aaron drinks decaf like me, but, but you know, it's, it's like, we, we, there's a certain piece of lived experience that is irreplaceable. Right. Yeah. And so with we and and there's a certain piece of of looking at things without having lived through it that is also irreplaceable. So I just think it enriches the conversation to have people from different ages and stages of life in this space, bringing their perspective and a different point of view. Yeah. And when I look at sort of the range of guests that you've had, I mean, you've had some younger guests and you've had some older guests and some that are, you know, right there where you are in life. And it's really helpful to hear from those people because they were around before pept or bioregulators was even a a thing. Maybe, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's really helpful to get their take on the conversation from like a science and research perspective, because they were there for a lot of this stuff from the jump, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really cool to see that. Like, well, we thought peptides could do this, but now we know peptides can do this. And my generation's like, yeah, peptides are great. I, I can get them anywhere. I can get them online. You know, and like <laughs> people were in the lab studying them and figuring out what they do and what they, um, you know, what they're capable of and things like that. So I think from an age perspective, it's really good to hear from, you know, scientists and researchers and doctors who have had years of experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a generational thing for sure. Yeah. But, you know, we try to keep a, you know, you try to keep that, you want to bring that energy to the conversation from wherever you are. And, yeah. And that's the, that's, that's the goal. Yeah. And so speaking of all your interviews that you've had, <laughs> um, we're ringing in episode 100. Uh, I think you said that at the beginning, but I just want to emphasize that one zero zero. That's a lot of podcast conversations, people. It's a lot. I've been in the podcasting world now for five years and it takes a lot to get to episode 100. There's a lot of people that are just like, okay, that was fun at episode 30. And they're like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. So you just plowed right through. We have no shortage of guests coming um, for, you know, in the future. So that's really exciting. Uh, my question to you is what are some of the most surprising interviews you've had? Mm, Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's such a great question. Well, I think, look, at the end of the day, any interview I've done that's talked about peptides has blown me away. Um, Mm. and even when I'm talking to anything with Jean-Francois Tremblay, who's the who's the owner of CanLab, which is a really top-notch research lab in Montreal. Every time I dig into peptides with him, that we have a conversation, he says something else that just kind of knocks me back on my butt, right? Like, I think I know a lot of stuff. And then next thing you know, something comes out of his mouth. And I'm like, come on, like, you've been holding out on me yet again. And he's like, no, not, you know, like when we're researching and this and that. And like one of the ones... There was episode 54 um, is the one where we did this bioregulator update. And in the bioregulator update, Jean-Francois shared that, and, and this was an amazing thing for him to share because, you know, at the end of the day, he's running a business. 
he was selling bioregulators to be used at a certain dosage. Um, and he had come across information and then went out and dug up the research and realized that there'd been um, an error in translation of the Russian texts and that the synthetic bioregulator dosages were actually, I don't even know what the math is, but maybe like one hundredth of what people were using. So there's been a dogma around that, like the rule of thumb has been, oh, you do bioregulators, you do 100 milligrams over 10 to 20 days as your cycle. So people would use five to 10 milligrams a day of the bioregulator. It turns out that that 10 milligram a day dose really related to the oral bioregulators. The synthetic bioregulator, which is what we would, what gets synthesized in the lab and is really just that two to four amino acid chain, it yeah. turns out that what the Russian papers referred to there was a hundred microgram dose. So that oh, wow. means your 20 milligram vial actually holds 200 doses of that bioregulator, <laughs> which is, which is amazing. Right. So if you think mm -hmm. about it from his perspective, from a business decision, this was a big deal. Right. Mm -hmm. But the truth is like, he's one of those guys, like you come across the information, you got to share it. You got to tell people. But yeah. what I want to impress on people is what's interesting about the bioregulators is because they're modulatory, because they're regulatory, they don't boost or depress. So you almost can't do like there's been no documented case of a negative side effect of a bioregulator. Mm -hmm. Sometimes very sensitive people will, they will react to them a little bit. And so then you just really want to pull them to pull back on the dose. So it's not that people have been doing harm. And I still see people in my group that swear by the five milligram a day for 10 or 20 days for a pit on because they feel it. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure you're supposed to feel it, but Having Got said it. that, you know, as a result, we're we're in space now where we've where our recommendations is like a hundred micrograms. Maybe you go up to a milligram a day if you really want to push it. But anyway, that was you know to answer your question, that was one of the most kind of surprising episodes. Another one, another one that I thought was really amazing to me, and that in many ways I feel hasn't gotten the attention it deserved, is episode sixty eight. Um, with a guest by the name of Dr. Drew Taylor. And mm -hmm. this was on the live stem cell banking episode. And oh, yeah, that was a cool episode. Right. So, this is a guy who's figured out a way to harvest stem cells from your hair follicles mm -hmm. and then offers people the opportunity to store those stem cells so that as the technologies come down the pipes, of all the amazing things we can do with stem cells, whether it's regrow cartilage or regrow your own organs or anything, any replacement parts you might need for your body, you actually have this stash of stem cells sitting in these freezers. Um, non -invasive. I, stem cells, totally non-invasive. Like I went into their office, he sat there with tweezers and plucked like 40 hairs out of the back of my head, making sure to get the hair follicle with it. Mm -hmm. And Bada bing, bada boom. Next thing you know, I've I've got four stashes of my stem cells in four different freezers in two different locations. So that that's like your knees if you need them in a few years. Right. And so and the and the amazing thing is the earlier you do it, the better, because the younger you are, the healthier your stem cells are. So I had said to him, Oh wow, you know, I really wish I would have done this when I was 30. He goes, Yeah, but here's the news you're as young today as you're ever going to be again. So that's true. And that's your biological right. age is probably not. What yeah, no, my biological age actually. is younger. <laughs> that's true. So there you go. True. So, so that was another one that was episode 68. I remember like I, I expected like people to be like stampeding, but of course this was at the beginning of like during COVID. So nobody could get here, but they will now send teams of technicians even to the U S to do like harvesting days in practitioner's offices. Anyway, so that was, that was that one. Cool. Um, you know, any conversation I have with Joel Green blows me away because he's just got such a unique approach, mm -hmm. um, to, to fat loss and really going at it as a root cause, like treating the immune system, really hacking away at the body systems for releasing fat, for resetting metabolism. Like he's, he's a really fascinating guy. He's one of those speakers. That's like, 
listening to a dictionary and a thesaurus and you almost have to listen to it on half speed versus like one and a half. Some people try to get their podcast really quickly, but yeah. Joel Green is one you have to listen to on half speed so you can take notes. Cause it's just like, it feels like he's reading from a book. He's just so knowledgeable and it's all top of mind. It's like, Whoa, dude, that's a lot. I need to take some notes. And a lot of it is stuff that nobody's thought of, or they haven't thought of it in that way. Right. Yeah. Like he's got yeah. this, he's got this incredible ability to look at problems or look at it, it, systems in the body in a deep, deep way, synthesize mm-hmm. the information and then say, well, if this, then that, and, mm-hmm. and put it together really in, in a brain. unique way. Yeah. So Do you have, did you um, write down our last Joel Green episode number, just in case people want to revisit. If not, we can. No, I, I wrote down the first one was 40, but the last one we'll put it in the show notes. Cause that yeah. was, it actually wasn't that long ago. It was maybe in the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, really check those out. He's so, he's so incredible to listen to. Yeah, no, he's great. And then, you know, obviously the, also the other one on the stem cell side is the calogen. Christian Drapeau, that was episode 93. That was not that long ago. Yeah, that um, one was excellent. I was I was really blown away by that. Yeah, like again, you know, to me, anything, and people have probably heard me say this before, but anything that can enable the body, and that's why I'm so fascinated by peptides. That's why they captured my attention the way they did, because anything that can help the body or trigger the body to do what the body does, mm-hmm. to me is is something worth paying a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. And and I remember when I first looked, there's two formulas, actually. There was the Calogen formula and also Nishido Time Plus. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't don't think I wrote down what number that was, but maybe we can add that to the the show notes. These are two supplements where you look at the supplements and you're like, yeah, it's a bunch of herbs. Like, yeah. How mind blowing can this possibly be? There's no peptide. There's no, there's nothing in there that really blows my mind. But then you talk to these people and you start to understand um, what these herbs do and how they interact with pathways in the body, like whether they're boosting a pathway or suppressing a pathway. And you're like, holy crap, nature's amazing, right? Yeah. And also listening to the links they go to to formulate these things to yeah. make them work. I mean, they're so, I mean, sure. There's people out there in the supplement industry that are just like supplements are a quick way to make a buck. And that is true, sadly, but can be the people that, yeah, the people that will just talk for an hour straight about just the science and the formulas and how they came to it and what they're really excited about and what they think could be next. That's the person you want to listen to and actually think about like, wow, they actually put a lot of thought into this and probably there's no way they'd put anything, you know, less than great in their body. And so that's probably what this is made of. Yeah, no. And they're just, I mean, all these guys, they're just so passionate, right? The, the other one was the one skin, um, where they discovered a peptide that actually can reverse the biological, like lengthen telomeres, of, mm-hmm. of skin cells. You've got the, which young- I'm still using, by the way, I really, oh, enjoy I, it. yeah, I, I'm like hooked on that now. I don't always like, I try not to purchase everything that I hear on podcasts <laughs> and I would not be making any money at all. Um, cause I produce several podcasts that talk about really cool stuff, but that one, I was like that just the way she was talking about, it, I was like, that sounds so incredibly fascinating. Like I want to give it a shot. And it was, I mean, to the day they're like, in a couple of days, you'll see this in a couple of days. I'll see that in a couple of weeks, you'll notice this. And I was like, Holy cow. If my skin is not glowing right now, like I, yeah. I never really had the sensation of my skin glowing. And I just always recognize that as a marketing term until I actually saw it. And I was like, Whoa, this stuff is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm hooked yeah. on that stuff. Yeah. That's it. And then you've got the young goose stuff, which just takes it to the yes. next level. The young goose Total next level. Yeah. What I love. Of, and you know, it's funny. People say, well, which one? I'm like, well, they're different. Like, yeah, they're yeah. Just different. Like they're doing different things. So this is where the podcast really helps people to get behind the scenes, to understand, first of all, the story of these people, what are their drivers? What's the science? And then make the, make your judgment call, you know, put it through your filter, whatever that may be and make that decision. But But like I said, you know, like I could probably give you, you know, there's, 
There's episode 39, the end myopia guy who is like, mm-hmm. you know, the eyeglass industry is a, is a total rip off and we can actually solve myopia if people were just yeah. given the information, which I'm like, okay, I kind of wish I would have met you 30 years ago. And then- <laughs> <laughs> same, same. Well, that's actually a good segue um, into how do you choose what you use? Like there's so many different amazing products and technology that you're introduced to on a regular basis. I mean, you would probably look, you would probably have a whole room in your house full of different things that you needed to do. Oh, maybe you do already. I do. <laughs> of things, And there's just like no way you can get through the day if you have to do all of these biohacking things. So what, how do you decide what sticks for you? Yeah, I think I, you know, and this is what I advise my clients is we look at what are your goals and what are your pain points? What are the things that you, that need to be addressed for you right now? What's your long goal? And how do we start to layer? And and it's about layering, right? So you, you just, you, you get to a point where you start to layer stuff and pick what resonates for you and what doesn't. There are certain things that I've talked about on the podcast that I, I still think are great. They don't work for me that well. And yet other things that really stick, right? So right now for me, what sticks, let's say for on the exercise front is the katsu. The katsu system makes all the sense in the world for me. There, yeah. there have been other workout things that I still believe I still talk to clients about. I still encourage people to use, but for me, it, it never really, it didn't work for me. Not, not that it, that if I had stuck to it, it wouldn't have created results, but it didn't fit into whether it's my psyche or my, or my lifestyle or my body, what my body needed. And I think understanding that about yourself is really important on the supplement side. Look, I'm not going to lie. I take a lot of supplements, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I just, and I do think as we, as we get older, we want to find that line between how little can we take, but where, where are the, where are the chinks in the armor that we want to reinforce? We always want to be doing the lifestyle stuff that, that provides the underpinning for all of this stuff, because one thing I've learned, and I think most people know this, you can't replace proper nutrition, sleep, stress management, getting out, proper light. Like you cannot outhack that. You can maybe outhack it if you're traveling and you're you're, you know, you're undergoing exposure to jet lag or radiation in the air. So you're gonna, I'm gonna be wearing my EMF blocking clothing. I'm going to be pounding my molecular hydrogen. Like these are things that have become ingrained in my in my day-to-day, if you will. Mm -hmm. But in, in my day-to-day stuff, I've just gradually just layered all of these things one of one at a time in a way that makes sense. And then on the supplement side, like I said, look, I take a boatload of supplements, but I also cycle them. Yeah. So I'll take, I'll do a certain protocol for three months. Then I'll do another protocol for three months. Like, you know, right now I'm loving the timeline. That podcast hasn't even come out yet, or it's going to come out in the next, actually it will have come out by the time this podcast it's recorded, ready Mm -hmm. to go. Um, Timeline nutrition, that urolithin A supplement has been, I, first of all, I love the protein shake ridiculously. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the best tasting protein shake on the planet. And the fact that it's got 500 milligrams of that urolithin A in it is even Mm -hmm. more exciting. Um, the nitric oxide support, I don't go a day without it. Molecular mm-hmm. hydrogen, people know they've heard me talk about it enough. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just don't. And, you know, it, and then the other one that I think really, and this was an episode that kind of rocked my world because it was so new at the time is the mm-hmm. primidine, the spermidine. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So primidine, I don't think I've been a day without it because I've seen what it can do for people. And, Mm -hmm. and that's one of those supplements where if you're in your thirties, you don't probably need it. Right. Mm -hmm. You really start to need supplements with spermidine in them later on, like after you're into your forties, probably older than 45, this is where our levels start to decline and where we want to start shoring them up. And that's where people will see the benefits. Yeah. The episode you did with Sandy Kaufman talks a lot about that and it's, it's two women speaking too. So that's even more interesting to me. Um, but just talking about like what 
you know, even at my age now in my thirties, what I can start to cycle Mm -hmm. to set myself up for a really great, you know, 40 to 50 or 50 to 60. And, you know, so I don't have to be able to buy them all and take them all now, but it's, I I now cycle different things and I feel, I feel like I'm doing something for future self. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I got you girl. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, your approach in your thirties is going to be different, but the good news is that you've got this long view now of saying, okay, where are the things that I want to start implementing now gradually Mm -hmm. so that I, I improve my course, you know, and yeah. don't go through necessarily all the bumps and things that some of us who've had to make up for lost time because we came to this much later. Yeah. Well, approaching my forties, but thank you. <laughs> you said thirties. I'm like, Oh, I wish I wish, but <laughs> um, in your thirties though. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Knocking at forties door pretty soon. Well, I got a few years, but, um, yeah, I mean, I just think that, that some people can get really overwhelmed by, you know, but I mean, even purchasing that many supplements, right. That can be like a hefty, you got to really budget your, yeah. um, budget wisely with supplements. And so I think it's really good to just cycle them out. And so there's a really good explanation of kind of how to do that in that episode. I can't remember the name of uh, the number of it, but it's Sandy Kaufman's episode. Um, yeah. And actually I have another one. I'll have another one coming up with her because she has a new book coming out. So Oh, probably. Cool. I haven't even recorded it yet. That's why that's why Aaron sounds so surprised. But <laughs> yeah, I, like, we've been going back and forth. So we're going to be scheduling that real soon. Good for her. Um, okay, well, let's talk a little bit about peptides before we wrap up. I mean, over the past few years, you've become known for your hearty knowledge and love of peptide therapy. Um, people know you from your huge Facebook group, your summits, your forums that you've spoken at, uh, and now a conference that um, aren't you just mentioned you're speaking at the women's conference. It's going to be coming up or happening while this episode is airing. Um, and now your podcast. So I'm curious, like you talked a little bit about, you know, the fact that peptides brought you to your interest in biohacking, but where did you hear about peptides? Like what was the beginning of that for you? I heard about peptides at a conference, like literally which one it was. Yeah. It was paleo FX. Um, Okay. It was Paleo FX three or four years ago now was probably okay. the first time, you know, and I might have heard about them a little bit before, but I didn't pay that much attention. But I was at that conference and I I'm when I go to conferences, I spend a lot of time in the tech hall. I don't spend a whole lot of time in the lectures, unfortunately, <laughs> because I'm so busy connecting. And this has been a thing, right? I didn't even have a podcast at the time, but I was even then. As a matter of fact, I actually think that conference would have been the very first time I ever interviewed someone and put it up for people to watch. And that was oh, if cool. you go to my YouTube channel, there's a and you go way, way back, there's an <laughs> interview with Greg Kelly from Qualia, from Neurohacker Collective. Uh And because I was like, at the time, I had just tried Qualia for the first time. And that is, that's in the nootropic space. That is next to my Nootopia box. Qualia is my other go-to, but I was so blown away by the supplement. I was like, Greg, would you sit and talk to me and could we record it? And could I put it up? And that was the very, very first interview I ever did, um, recorded and pushed out to the public. But that was the conference where I really heard about peptides for the first time. And I was actually sitting in on Dan Stickler's talk because I was just tired. I needed to sit down. (laughs) And 10 minutes in, I was like slack jawed because he was at that point, he was talking about a pitalon. He was talking Mm -hmm. about melanotan too. And I was like, get out of town. There's no way anybody, anything can do something like this. And it just, you know, it just grabbed my attention. And shortly thereafter, I heard Jean-Francois Tremblay on a podcast. And then I'm like, oh my God, he's French. He's in Montreal. I'm from Montreal. I speak French. I'm going to call him, which I don't think I've ever done that before. And I did. And that was the beginning of the end because he he really has been my mentor for the last three years. Like Jean-Francois, for whatever reason, took me under his wing and I've learned so much from this guy. And this is a man who's had knowledge of and worked with peptides for a lot longer than pretty much anybody else out there. Yeah. And part of that is because he comes out of the bodybuilding world way, way back. And bodybuilders, of course, 
are the quintessential biohackers. Like you want to talk yeah. about people manipulating oh, their bodies. That's what they do. That's rough stuff though. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not always that's cool. Not I always mean, healthfully. <laughs> They're not generally yeah, the most long-lived people, unfortunately. I know, but that explains so much about your your vast knowledge in it. I mean, look at your mentorship. He's he's like the guy. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of people out there in the peptide space, but he's if there's going to be a mentor for peptides, he's one that you want for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm very grateful. <laughs> What would you say to someone who's just starting to learn about peptides? Um, I mean, even, even myself, like I, I have produced many a health podcast, um, but peptides really have never come up. It's been a lot of, in the microbiome lane and gut health and holistic psychology and things like that. And so when I started working with you, I was like, you know, I don't know much about peptides. It's really fascinating. So what would you say to someone like me? That's kind of wanting to dip their toe in it. Um, I don't really have any specific, reasons for it other than I, you know, I hear they're really good for longevity. So in the longevity lane, what can people do? Where can they go to buy them or try them? What do you say to someone who's a healthy person, but really interested in peptides? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the first thing is to understand that what peptides are. And, you know, a lot of the people listening to this know this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but they are the, the peptides that we talk about, the BPC 157s, the thymus and beta 4s, the CJC epimorelins, like, and you know, if you don't know peptides, I'm speaking Greek at this point to you. I apologize for that. But you and know, I'm like somebody, the CJ what? CJC 1295, no DAC slash epimorelin. Like that's two peptides. <laughs> Basically, these are all signaling molecules that can get your body to like re-engage your body in different processes it needs to do right? So whether that is initiating repair of soft tissue or even bone tendons, ligaments. So those are like your repair peptides, the BPC-157, the thymus and beta-4. The CJC and epimorelin, for example, these are peptides that can help to encourage your body to make more growth hormone. So, and growth hormone happens to be a very powerful anti-aging compound, but you have to treat it with respect, right? On the other side, and then we've got, and, or we've got immune peptides like thymus and alpha one, which will help to, to bring balance back to an immune system that may be out of balance. It's really, really helpful for people with anything autoimmune going on. Mm. So what about new moms who are catching every bug that their two-year-old brings home? (laughs) Yeah. So first of all, as long as you're not nursing, yes, you can play with peptides. Um, And I get asked that question a lot, right? From pregnant and nursing moms. The truth is we don't, and we don't have as much of the double blind clinical trial studies Mm -hmm. as we would like on any of the peptides. People are still trying to figure out how they work. We know a lot, but there's still so much still to be elucidated. And mostly because we don't really understand a lot about how the body works sometimes. It's it's too complex. So you know, for a new mom who needs immune support because they're, I mean, you, you know, Erin's had a heck of a few months with her son (laughs) who's adorable. Oh my God, the cutest child on the planet. However, who's just in that early daycare experience where he's picking up every bug. I mean, is it possible that a thymus and alpha one could be helpful to help your system? Possibly. I mean, it might be something to, to, to leverage and to try. But, you know, to answer your question about where do people start is you really have to start with what are my goals? Why do I want these peptides? If you're, you know, what can they do? So one of the things I'm hard at work at right now is kind of a peptide simplified resource for people to help orient people around peptides. So what are they for? What are my options? What are the top I started with the top 10, then I had to go to the top 12. Then I had to go, well, it's a dirty dozen. (laughs) There's going to be, you know, there's going to be more modules. There's obviously more than 13 peptides out there, but there's, as they get discovered, like there's over 7,000 known peptides in the human body. And Mm. so what they are is they're, they, they, they signal, they, they turn things on and off, but they bind to receptors on the cell and initiate cascades. The bioregulators, on the other hand, which is where we really turn our attention to for anti-aging or healthy aging, is Mm. these are epigenetic switches. Right. So these Mm. guys get into the cell, they get into the nucleus, they hit on the, they bind to DNA, 
and they upregulate genes, like they switch genes on or off. And what in a nutshell they're able to do is they're, they seem to be able to drive regeneration of tissues, glands, and organs in the body, which restores function. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Then we can age more healthfully. Yeah. They don't do them in a vacuum though. So again, those All of those things that we talk about, all of those lifestyle things, all of those things about reducing toxic load, all of the pieces of addressing any underlying issues that you have, the bioregulators are very helpful. But if you you bring them into a very toxic environment, they're only going to be able to do so much. Yeah. And peptides are a little bit like that too, with the exception that I would say for BPC-157, for example, you have someone with a lot of gut issues. Sometimes even before they make those changes, we can help them to feel a little bit better with mm. a BBC 157. And sometimes that just brings back the energy and the willingness and frankly, even the belief that things can get better for them. Yeah. And, and, and it gives them a foothold. But generally speaking, educate yourself, whether it's listening to podcasts, joining the group, if I can ever get this resource out there, I think it'll be really helpful to people just to give them again, a starting point yeah. uh, and a place of knowing, well, where do I begin? Mm-hmm. Um, and then in maybe terms- just start with a, where do I begin guide? I know that's a lot of already a lot of work, but like you could push it out one one you piece know, at a time, one page at a time, and people will be excited. Yeah, no kidding. I should it. start like an email list and just one page, one page, one page a week. Um, so, so there's that, and you know, I think there are increasing numbers of practitioners and physicians out there that are becoming really well versed in peptides, and I've I try to find them and have them on the podcast as much as possible um, because there's not enough out there, and the ones that are out there sometimes can be hard to find. So. But yeah. finding those people now there's with these peptide summits, um, there's so much good information and the peptide summits, I really think also are a great opportunity to get exposure to these people so that you're like, oh, I love what this person's saying. I'm going to reach out mm-hmm. to them. So yeah, whatever speaks to you. There's a, there's a handful of episodes that we've done on peptides specifically. I think 42, 46 and 47 were ones that um, if you're interested in hearing what, you know, some top peptide people have to say, that's a yeah, good place well, to start, right? Yeah. Those, those specifically speak to the bioregulators. Oh, so bioregulators. Those, are, okay. those are like the hallmark bioregulator episodes. There's and also, we did a bioregulator episode in early May. So Phil yeah. McCann's right. Yeah. Yeah. Phil Mikan's. And then oh, episode goodness. going way back episode 25, I did a deep, deep dive on BPC 157. Oh, great. And I know that people keep finding that episode because it's one of the most downloaded episodes I've ever recorded. Um, Also, anything that I recorded with Elizabeth Yurth, Suzanne Taylor, Mm. um, who else? Gus Vickery earlier this year, we talked about peptides Mm. a little bit. Um, There's... I mean, a lot of the doctor ones, you will, that if you go back to those, you will find anything with Jean-Francois obviously is all about peptides. We'll, I'm actually just going to be moving. As a matter of fact, episode 101 is a peptide episode with Jean-Francois. Oh, nice. So we've got another one coming up next week, coming up next. Um, But yeah, you know, and I think that if, um, I I love hearing from people. So you guys, if you come across amazing practitioners, Oh, Edwin Lee, that's another one. Dr. Edwin Mm -hmm. Lee, we put out, we push, we, we published an episode with him. I want to say January or February of this year. Yeah. That's, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. If you hear other, you know, on other podcasts or discover other, you know, peptide, nerds (laughs) nerds <laughs> like like bring, us, like bring them in <laughs> send them our way hit net them our up way. on facebook or instagram and send her a direct message um so before we start to wrap up um, i have a question for you for you specifically if you had to take three different kinds of peptides with you on a deserted island what would they be oh geez actually i have a good answer for that so my first one would be a pitalon which is a bioregulator And it's the pineal gland bioregulator. And that is because the pineal gland is basically the master endocrine regulator of your body. So 
epitalon, epitalon for me would be right at the top of the list. Okay. Next would be BPC-157, which is your traditional peptide. And that's because BPC-157 is like, it's like the Swiss army knife of peptides. It Ooh, does. Definitely it does, a deserted island peptide. <laughs> it does everything, right? It helps to repair yeah. things. It's good for the brain. It's good for the organs. Like it's good for everything. So it's kind of like your everything peptide. My next choice, this is kind of tricky. Um, I might have to pick the blood vessel bioregulator. It's a kind of a toss up between the blood vessel bioregulator, because of course, if we have great circulation, everything goes well in the body Yeah. or it might have to be um, probably thymogen, which is the thymus bioregulator because okay. so if we have amazing immunity, if we've got this kind of master circadian rhythm, endocrine master regulator, epitalon at the top, we then have great immunity. And then we have something to initiate repair. Nice. Yeah. I guess that that's it. If I could have a fourth, then I would take the blood vessel. <laughs> <regulator>. <laughs> no, no, just three. No, They're only okay. little. Well, take a fourth <laughs> peptide because she's only because she's not netum. She gets to take a fourth peptide. Everyone else you're riddled with three pe peptides. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. Um, tell us how we can help more people find the podcast and any other closing thoughts you want to say for this hundredth episode. Well, I think, I think my, the biggest thing I want to say is thank you to all the people who are listening to this podcast, all the people who have listened to the podcast. I just, I'm really I'm blown away by the comments that I get from people. Mm. I'm grateful that I get to do this. And it's thanks to you guys that I get to do this. So thank you for your encouragement, for your participation, for everything. Um, I just think- and thanks for sharing. It's, it's and for evident sharing. to me as a, as a producer that people are really sharing out this podcast because it's growing at an exponential rate and we want to keep seeing that happen. So thank you all for sharing or for posting or whatever it is you're doing. Absolutely. Like the, for the sharing, for the reviews. Um, yeah. And frankly, honestly, guys, I even want to come out and say thank you for using the links in the podcast because, mm -hmm. you know, those links is what it's what keeps the podcast going. Like podcasters, mm -hmm. we do this out of passion. We do this because we love it. But, you know, then we, we have to hire amazing people to help us and we have to, there's lots of costs associated with it. And it's, it's kind of how, what makes the machine roll. So thank yeah. you for using the links. Like I'm grateful to all of you guys for doing that. When, <clears throat> when something resonates for you, please understand that when I bring stuff out to you guys, it's, I offer to you for your consideration and, yeah. you know, and then it's about understanding, helping you to understand in any way that I can, if it's appropriate for you, whether it's through the podcast in the Facebook group, some people re reach out to me, they'll hire me and we'll do a consult. And sometimes I can help them to kind of siphon through the information kind of thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I think that's it. I, I think I'm, I'm just um, keep an eye out. Also, I am going to bring out this peptide simplified resource thing at some point. It's going to happen. She said it. Now it's got to happen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's going to happen. I just don't exactly 2022. know. I think we, we can get it out there in 22. Yeah, it has to happen in 2022. Yeah. So keep your eyeballs open for that. I think most people don't get really any insight from the production side of the podcast. So if I may, um, podcasting does take, it, it does take a small village. It takes a team to happen. So you have your host and, and even before I became a, a production, uh, a director and a producer, I thought, oh, okay, well, people, you know, either jump on zoom or sit in a room, record something and just upload it to wherever. <laughs> and really it's so much more than that. You know, it's, um, it's booking the guests, which just sounds easy, but people have very complicated schedules. So sometimes <laughs> yeah. it can be 20 emails, you know, deep until you've got a date and a time that works for everybody. Um, it's the equipment, it's, uh, an editor, it's someone writing the content. It's someone putting the content onto the website. It's someone turning the content into images and putting that on social media. It's someone, um, you know, always looking out for the data on the podcast hosting site. It's, um, it's just like a countless number of things. Right. And then also just 
having the, or, it all organized, you know, mm. where does the person drop the, you know, the audio so that the editor can find it so that the transcriber can find it so that it's just so many different steps. Yeah, you would yeah. be shocked. <laughs> like well, how you bring up, you bring up a great point, Erin, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank the team. And oh, I don't yeah, know, but, team, no, but team listen, this, this team, like starting with Erin here, who I honestly don't think I'd be doing the podcast anymore if it wasn't for you. <laughs> because <laughs> when we met, I was drowning. Um, but there's Aaron, so much, and right? then there's our audio, incredible audio and video editor, yeah. um, whose name is <laughs> Matthew, Matt Meadows, who actually was a group member and reached out to me way oh, back cool. and said, like, hey, I want to help you. <laughs> hey, hey, do you think you need an editor? And I was like, you know, I didn't even know there was such a thing, but yeah, I think that would be great. And so, and he's been with me ever since and he's awesome. And then another group member is Jennifer Matthews, who any of you guys who are in the group know her as she's the moderator and another admin in the Facebook group. But what you guys don't know is that Jen picks up the pieces in a million ways, both for the podcast mm -hmm. and just to hold me together. And so between the three of you guys, I, this, none of this would happen. So yeah, I mean, I gratitude. certainly wasn't fishing for compliments. No, no, but you know what? I it just was like, like, I can't believe I didn't come out with it myself. Like, no, I mean, like, often I just, I don't think people get to hear what it takes. And so yeah. anytime people are like, oh gosh, another, another product. Well, first of all, Nat's bringing, uh, Nat doesn't get paid for all the different people that she brings on. Um, she just really likes these products. Right. And sometimes there's a, a deal for you in it, which is cool. But in terms of, you know, hearing from our sponsors, that's so critical because this whole team of, you know, of people has to get paid for their work. Right. So I just don't often get to share like what the behind the scenes looks like. So I thought, totally. like, let me just, let me just tell people if they're curious, like, how does the podcast happen? Not to discourage anyone from starting it, but it is, yeah. it, it's, it's a hefty load sometimes, especially if you want to really go to one. Um, yeah. so, yeah. and yeah. we say no to a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we sometimes have to say no. Sometimes even after we record, it does happen. The world but. is an interesting place. There are very interesting people. Um, but anyway, so just to close out, thank, thank you everyone again. Um, please keep sharing, you know, if you'll drop a review and five stars that helps the algorithm actually in Apple and Spotify and many other um, different places that this podcast lands, it helps actually push our podcast out to more people when they find out that you like it. Um, so that's really important for all your podcasts that you listen to. Yeah, exactly. Not just this one. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Erin, for joining me today. I really yeah. appreciate it for you jumping 100th. on into the camera. And thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah thanks for listening guys it's been a slice thank you and i'm looking forward to another hundred amazing episodes